Kia ora Tato, welcome back. Kia ora, is that working? I can't hear myself, but I hope you can hear me. Uh, so we're starting our panel now on gender and inclusive trade, off the back of the two fabulous speakers that we've just had um, from Canada and from the OECD. So it really gives me very great pleasure to introduce our three panellists this afternoon. Carrie Stoddard-Smith, Principal Indigenous Trade and Economies of Opino Native. Stephanie Honey, Associate Director of the New Zealand International Business Forum. And Jackie Curry, who is Acting Chief Executive of Pacific Cooperation Foundation. So we're gonna take our uh, panellists in the order of the program. So I'm gonna hand over to Carrie. Kia ora. For my timer. All right, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, ko Carrie Stoddard-Smith toko ngo e no nga pohi me nga te pātua uh, Sometimes I lean toward a bit of what some people might call a lecturing, but I'm trying to be there all today for the most part. But for me, the whakapapa of ideas in order Whakapapa of ideas matters in order to make sense of how we got to where we are now. For instance, we're here having this conversation today on gender and trade dialogue because a bunch of basic dudes set in motion a system, patriarchy, that would structurally disadvantage women around the world what has almost been 2,000 years. The imposition of that heinous system through colonisation and the subsequent British common law in Aotearoa displaced the role of wahine Māori and has disadvantaged and discriminated against us for almost two centuries. Patriarchy devastated our socioeconomic structures, where we were once thriving economically. Wahine and Tane had dual roles that enhanced the balance in that structure, where we were considered as equal contributors to the well-being of the collective. Patriarchy distorted the role of Wahine Māori in traditional Māori society, and generations of Māori men also bought into that. It impacted our rights over our land, our rights to speak on behalf of our people, and our rights to undertake roles that were not considered fitting for a woman in the new society. As a result, over time, it impeded the right and ability of mana wahine Māori to hold decision-making roles in their hapu, iwi, and more recently, in commercial entities and on governance or advisory boards. I started my business, Opinio Native, partly in response to what I considered a perpetual colonisation, and the internalised patriarchy that I witnessed is still in existence in many parts of Te Ao Māori. It also troubled me that people called it all about colonisation as if it's a thing that happened in the past, unaware that it's simply disguised today in structural racism and the continued non-recognition of Māori sovereignty over our lands and resources. We continue to negotiate and renegotiate our inclusion in decision-making bodies. Despite having established instruments such as He Whakaputanga o Te Rangatira o Nitirini, the Declaration of Independence of the United Tribes of New Zealand, sorry, I've got anxiety, in the Treaty of Waitangi, the real Māori version that the vast majority of independent chiefs signed, both of which sought to assert our continued sovereignty and to advance our trade and resource rights toward peace in this country. Our cultural and political identities continue to be shaped by these instruments. So I wanted to carve out a distinct space that would elevate Māori and Indigenous peoples to trade and economic perspectives. I especially had women's voices at top of mind because women have been central in my journey. In fact, I attribute the genesis to three specific women, women who unknowingly unwove the threads that bound me to an old way of thinking and empowered me with the tools I would need later on when the path to indigenous trade revealed itself to me. All three were from this university where I completed my law degree, and they're all worthy of mentioning by name. Balmain Tuki instilled in me a deep commitment to advancing indigenous rights and interests, to be proud as Māori, and to also be comfortable having loud words, even though I had a quiet voice. Our previous panellist, Amakura Kafuru, unlocked my fascination of international arbitration, a paper I literally took to fill in a gap, but a paper that ultimately led to me pursuing my master's in international trade and relations. And a name I'm sure you'll all know, and I did see her here earlier, a relentless economic justice advocate and a voracious critic of neoliberalism in all its forms. Professor Jane Kelsey, who shifted my sights from a narrow legal track toward public policy, and through her practice showed me what Puno Pakia allyship looks like. Many women since have continued to lift, inspire, and support my journey in this space, including my tokana on this panel, Steph Honey. Many women since 
oh, sorry, it's all the, these women and more that I invoked when I was invited to speak here. However, I decided that rather than speaking on technical issues, I would speak on lived experience toward hope and toward peace. For me, the opportunity is to be part of the rewrite of an inclusive trade story that will shape the next 2,000 years. That is what gives me hope. Over the past few decades, we've had some positive movements toward undoing the injustices caused by patriarchal systems and its mate, misogyny, including in a trade and economic context. Instruments like the recent ITAG gender and trade arrangement, for example, intend to address these issues. But it will take generations for us all to collectively unlearn the internalized biases and prejudices against women that still exist and domain dominated and overprotected by men. As Marion Jensen noted before, rules only go some way to progressing the unlearning process. Unlearning habits is a much longer game. Without an ambitious implementation plan for arrangements like ITAG, they will only create short-term enthusiasm with no real structural gains. On the 80-20 rule, intention is only 20% of the battle. The ITAC agreement is simply that, intention. 80% more effort must go into the implementation. I appreciate measurable and achievable targets for evidence-based policy, but it's going to require more than promoting a few women-centered activities to sustain that long-term momentum towards structural change. Also, what I've learned through the works of people like Arnie McKay and Linda Tuhiwai Smith, that we don't unlearn anything by shying away from our discomfort. If we are to create an inclusive trade story, then that must begin with the un uncomfortable, to build trust by deconstructing the patriarchy through the habitual practice of radical inclusion in international trade. This won't be achieved with a pen or paper or through the dialogue of appeasement. It can only be achieved through a commitment to the redistribution of power. Redistribution of power is not complex. It's not about renouncing or supplanting. It's fundamentally about sharing. Look at who holds power and who doesn't and share it with them. Their perspectives matter. Perspectives is important here too, because when I think about inclusion and trade, I think about diversity, and diversity is about perspectives. The perspectives of women in general, but importantly, the perspectives of women of color, disabled women, trans women, young women, and old women. Women who experience marginalization due to multiple and overlapping social, political, cultural, and class identity as sites of discrimination. Women are not hom homogenous, and as such, inclusion must be radical. It must always be striving for the greatest and broadest level of representation, because the greatest potential for this gender and trade dialogue, in my view, is the step change toward trading and perspectives through radical inclusion, so that we can change that narrative and practice for the next 2,000 years. We must peer beneath the technical trade surface and look at the core of it all, enduring relationships built on trust, respect, toward a mutual peace. For Māori, this is the essence of whanaungatanga. At this point, I first mahi to Chris Karamea Inslee, chair of Te Taumata, a staunch supporter and enabler of my journey, and many other wahine of my generation. But I looked at Te Taumata here to simply emphasise as well that gender representation is equally an issue for Māori in the trade sector. At a macro level, the establishment of the Māori Trade Advisory Board that has one wahine representative out of total eight members, despite there being a population of almost 20,000 more wahine than Tane, that must be acknowledged. I recognise that Te Taumata has committed to convening a range of technical working groups which could include wahine. But the question remains for me, when, when we ask around who has the right expertise and measure and toward what end are we looking for that expertise? Wahine have been doing highly technical work across all parts of Te Ao Māori for decades without formal qualification, official recognition or decision-making capacity. But Te Taumata has an opportunity to lead on gender and trade. And I can tell you this is something I know that Chris and others are very mindful of. Te Taumata taking a lead would signify how new models of organisation function. It would restore the dual roles of wahine and tāne in te ao Māori in our new context. After all, wahine play a critical role from our creation to our deaths and beyond. To practice radical inclusion, te taumata could bring into the balance the mana wahine taumata that shares power with it. That uses our collective insights and perspectives in a way familiar to our tupuna, that we feel in our bones, valuing the trade and perspectives to validate our knowledge systems and enhance our understandings of and relationships to everything in this world. 
radical inclusion is visible and it's felt. It's at the center of how Māori survived the journey to Aotearoa and our early experiences of colonization. Tracy Hopeupper recently surmised at the Tāmaki Makoto Economic Summit that we need ecosystems, not hierarchies. The ITAG agreement is an opportunity to build that. We can build these ecosystems from the edges where diversity thrives. Therefore, my call to action to you all here today, in person and online, is to include an action toward establishing perspective ecosystems and the implementation of the ITAG arrangement. I ask that you will open your minds to new forms of organization, to commit to sharing power, to advance toward trade and perspective so you can become an enabler of systems change. Let us all contribute to rewriting the trade story for the next 2,000 years, a story of radical inclusion in international trade. Nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, thank you, Kerry. Steph. Stephanie needs no introduction, obviously. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Jen. And uh, may I say it's nice to come out from behind the video screen as well. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, um, to you, Jennifer, to Suzanne, who's, who's you know, done so much work behind the scenes, the Poli uh, Public Policy Institute in Auckland University. It's really fantastic to have an opportunity to, like this to actually take a breath and think about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we can do it better. And I think trade and gender is an area that really benefits from that opportunity um, because it's an area that, you know, has become increasingly prominent in trade policy, but it's unfortunately also an area where it's quite hard to get your, your arms around the problem. It's been an area that's often, you know, suffered from a lack of data, as we've heard from our, our video speakers and, and from Carrie earlier. Um, and I'd really endorse Georgina's call to, to arms, to action, um, that it's something that, you know, policymakers really need to invest in. Looking at you, Vangeli, uh, I know that Economic Division has been doing some fantastic work uh, trying to understand the sort of deeper statistical and econometric and economic analysis basis of all of this, and I think it's something that really matters. And actually, something that has been very helpful that's come out this year has been a new report from the WTO and the World Bank on trade and gender. I'd warmly encourage you all uh, to take a look. It's a, it's a good read, um, and there are a few video uh, sort of presentations on the WTO and World Bank website on it. But that really vividly illustrates, I think, the sort of the business case, if you like, for, for taking action in this space. Uh, some of the, the analysis that they've done has shown that there's a very strong positive relationship between uh, greater gender equality and per capita GDP. Um, they've also found that countries that trade more have lower levels of gender inequality. Countries that give women more rights tend also to have more diverse trade relationships. And I think, you know, if, if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that you shouldn't be putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, and they've also found something that I, I think is, has been quite well known in trade economics for a long time, which is that internationally traded sectors tend to be more productive, um, you know, pay higher wages and so on, but critically in this context also employ more women and pay them more. So, I mean, it's not just about jobs, it's about better jobs, and that has a broader social value, as, as we've heard so, you know, vividly illustrated this morning. I think we also have a great opportunity here because, of course, we can't ignore the COVID context. And unfortunately, the sectors where women work and predominate have been very hard hit by COVID. Um, some work that the McKinsey Global Institute has done um, has found that 40% of, um, of the sectors where women tend to predominate have been hardest hit by COVID. Women make up 39% of the global workforce, but 54% of the job losses this year. So, you know, there's clearly a sort of a push and a pull. There's a great opportunity here to uh, improve our whole society, but also a real challenge um, to, uh, you know, to sort of address some of the, uh, the impact of COVID. Um, so what can trade policy do? Well, I'm not going to rehearse the, the fantastic insights that we heard from Marion and from, um, from Georgina this morning, but I think, you know, part of this, this trade ecosystem and the trade dialogue is not just understanding the economic analysis, which is crucial, 
the policymakers' perspective, which is crucial, but also the business perspective, because of course, at the end of the day, trade officials don't trade, it's people and businesses that trade. So I have the privilege to be the policy advisor to the New Zealand members of the APEC Business Advisory Council and my, my you know, visionary leader in that space, Rachel Talele, spoke to you all yesterday. So a few years ago, we, um, we did some research, ABAC New Zealand led this research uh, that was undertaken by the University of Southern California's Marshall School of Business that looked at how to enable small businesses uh, more in trade and especially women-led small businesses. And some of the findings from that research, which, which went out and talked to over 500 businesses and policymakers around the Asia-Pacific region, were quite interesting. They really underscored the points that Georgina and Marion made because the women businesses they talked to said that they did find a lot of barriers in their economic activity and in trade, including identifying and connecting with foreign networks and customers, finding and understanding trade rules, addressing non-tariff barriers, including some of the sort of procedural obstacles like, as Marion talked about, getting through customs, processes and so on, um, but also in the services space, so sort of the backbone services that enable trade, like finding access to logistics and supply chains, which is something that's a real problem for New Zealand businesses right now. Um, but also in the digital space. And, and in the interview that I did with Marion, you know, we talked about what digital can do, which I think is incredibly powerful, but there are also really big challenges for women to access that. And the, the WTO report I mentioned also identified that there is this unfortunately and unbelievably an internet um, gender gap as well. Um, also around trade financing and insurance. Um, and again there, the WTO report gave some really good statistical work on that. It found, for example, that even where every other condition was identical, women had a 30% higher um, requirement to find a guarantor for trade financing. So that's not just around sort of cash flow to, to enable your exporting activity, it's around things like investment, research and development to scale up and, and to, to internationalise. So really key considerations there. And um, I think, you know, it's really important when we look at opportunities like the ITAG Global Trade and Gender Arrangement, which is fantastic, it helps to raise the profile of these issues, but it also gives a platform where countries, policymakers, and businesses can talk about how we address these challenges. I mean, I think there's clearly no one size fits all solution and no single answer, but you know, it's really important to understand the problem and try to find the solutions. But I'd like to finish, I know I've, I've only got one, one minute left, Suzanne, I know you're looking at me angrily. Um, but one of the other interesting findings, which really um, you know, speaks to my, my former life as a trade negotiator, one of the findings from the WTO report is that the sectors where women tend to be heavily represented are also those where there are big trade barriers. So I'm looking at you, agriculture, textiles, services, and digital, and I think I would, I would give a challenge to all of you in the, the trade negotiation space. You know, if you're looking for a good argument as to why, you know, we might want to reduce tariffs or open up restrictive tariff rate quotas um, for agricultural goods, um, then, uh, you know, if you needed another argument, if food security wasn't enough for you, or uh, you know, sustainability wasn't enough for you, well, inclusive trade makes the case very strongly there as well. And in my last 30 seconds, Suzanne, um, I would like to also give a little advertisement. One of the fantastic things that I've been involved with the last few years is a social enterprise called Trade Experts. You might have seen us tweeting on Twitter. We also have a website, tradeexperts.org, and we are a network of international women trade experts, we try to shine a light on the fantastic intellectual powerhouses that women can be in this space. And it's open to all, so I encourage you all to join, follow us on Twitter, join up. Um, there are great opportunities for trade education, for mentorship, for writing blogs. You know, we, we post regular blogs from, from women trade experts. So looking at you, all the women in the room, and of course, all the men as well as, as champions for that work. And my time is up now. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Steph. And now I'm going to hand over to Jackie. Um, 
Talofa Lava, everyone. Uh, I'm very privileged to be here today. Uh, thank you to Jennifer and Suzanne and um, your team for this amazing opportunity uh, to be with um, everyone here in the trade policy space. Um, so I've been reflecting the last few days, um, I guess what angle can I come into this with, um, given I've worn several hats over the years. And I guess the angle that, I, or what I'd really like to talk to today, um, I guess in the Pacific space we call it Atalanoa, a is something a bit more casual, but really talking about some of the experiences that I've observed with some of the women that I know that are in trade in the, in, um, that are from the Pacific region and also here in New Zealand. So I just wanted to share some stories with you. Um, I wanted to start with um, a, a proverb from a Samoa. So I'm Samoan, um, proudly raised in Samoa as well. And I wanted to, to speak about this uh, proverb, e auli inai lau atama itai. Uh, that proverb is from the village of Falealupo on the furthest point of Savai, beautiful isolated village in Samoa, the absolutely beautiful beach, by the way. I'm sure you're all waiting for those borders to open so you can visit it. Um, and uh, many moons ago, now pre-colonial times, uh, the village Matais or chiefs uh, gave the Awaluma and the Aumanga, who um, Awaluma are the young women in the village and Aumanga are the young men in the village, a task. There were two um, Falesamos, uh, I guess much like this, but probably a bit smaller, and the roofs hadn't been thatched yet. So they gave the job to a group of young women and a group of young men. Guess who completed their roof first? Anyone want to have a guess? <laughs> um, it was the women, of course. The men sta stood around, um, you know, having discussions about who was going to do what. And, and um, anyhow, by the time they finished deciding how they were going to do it and what they were going to do, the women had already completed the roof. And the story goes that to this day, that Falisamo stands without a roof. So, <laughs> so anyhow, um, and this proverb is very much shows um, the level of respect um, that uh, someone men have for us women when we want to get something done, uh, we get it done. And um, that is very much the nature of uh, Pacific women. And this definitely carries over into the area of um, business and trade. Now, um, in terms of um, in, within the Pacific region, because um, I know there was a, um, one of our um, international speakers spoke about indigenous uh, women. Of course, our indigenous women in the Pacific, uh, sorry, our Pacific women in the region are very much indigenous women of the land. Um, and in the context of here in New Zealand, um, our women in business and in trade are uh, very much migrants. So it's a very different context that they operate in. And I think it's important to point that out. I'm actually carrying out some research at the moment into entrepreneurship. And, um, and it's really important to understand the difference between, um, I guess, the challenges for Pacific women, business women here in New Zealand uh, versus uh, our Pacific women in the islands in terms of that context. Now we come to the topic for today, inclusive trade. Now, um, seeing as I've uh, raised in the islands, I'm blessed to be brought up uh, very much in the uh, business um, community. Um, I have seen <laughs> a lot of um, not so inclusive trade opportunities, um, uh, and this is from for the context of the Pacific um, of one Pacific island. And um, I just wanted to note that you know there are many Pacific heroines that us uh, Pacific women look up to, and one I'll uh, mention is um, Nafanua. She was, um, in pre-colonial times, the only uh, Samoan Matai or chief to hold the Tafaifa, which is the four main titles in Samoa. During that time, it is said that it was a time of peace, but also a time when trade was thriving um, in the region. And within that, in, in that time, uh, our main trading partners were Fiji and Tonga. 
So again, putting into context um, the success of our, um, our Pacific women in trade, um, and this was in pre-colonial times. Now, I just wanted to touch on um, my colleague here has shared about um, you know the introduction of uh, Christianity and colonization in our Pacific region, very much the introduction of uh, patriarchy definitely um, changed, I guess, um, a lot of things for Pacific women, uh, strong Pacific women such as Nafanua, uh, in terms of the impacts of that, we now very much still living in societies that are very much dominated by uh, patriarchal thinking and worldviews. However, as I mentioned, I wanted to share some, some stories now, um, if I look at um, Samoa again, because that's what I'm most familiar with, um, in terms of trade opportunities, some of the trade opportunities that I've seen on the ground with our grassroots, probably the main two that I'll bring up today out of interest, um, should any of our trade policy people here be thinking, what industries should we look at um, growing and supporting and um, giving more opportunity to when it comes to inclusive trade for women? I would definitely say that fashion and agribusiness would be the top two. Oh, two minutes already. I've only ch started telling the stories. Um, so in terms of fashion, um, there have been several fashion shows held across the Pacific. Pacific fashion designers have been taken all over the world. However, I've seen the barriers that they face in actually growing an industry and also the barriers that they've faced in terms of really breaking into the export markets that, um, and the fashion industry obviously is a multi-billion dollar industry. However, our Pacific women still face many barriers in, in, in fully participating in that global industry. Agribusiness, many of our women run niche uh, product agribusinesses in the islands in uh, products such as vanilla, honey, um, are probably the two um, that come to mind where our women are really thriving. And again, they face um, many different issues when it comes to um, trading these products, um, not to mention, you know, um, all the trade barriers that they would come up to and uh, and when um, trying to export to countries like New Zealand and Australia. Uh, and I guess I'd, I'll jump down now, because um, I'm running out of time, to I guess what I've seen in the Pacific Islands is really there is very low participation in the export of products of, uh, for women-based businesses. I see women um, that have amazing business opportunities, have amazing products, high quality products, but they face many barriers to being able to scale up their businesses and be able to meet the standards are required for, for trade and exports. I see um, a lack of data on women in trade in the Pacific for any of uh, you researchers out there. Um, there is a lot of, um, I guess, data and information on trade, but not much on how many women in trade. But I've seen it from grassroots, and I know that those numbers are very low. And I mentioned the opportunities to scale up. This is probably the biggest barrier that I've seen on the ground in the Pacific Islands when it comes to um, Pacific women fully participating in trade. What could be some of the solutions, since I'm running out of time? Um, investment. Now, I know that that's a word that's thrown out um, a lot in terms of up in the business development space. However, I have seen many um, opportunities to scale up businesses that could be actively participating in trade um, never come to fruition because of lack of investment. And even when those investment opportunities are available, I have seen a lack of business support as well to enable these business or these investment opportunities to come to pass. Anyhow, there's so much more I could say, but um, thank you again for your time. I've run out of time. Um, so that's just a little bit of insight about women in trade in the Pacific region. Fakhtai. Right, the floor is open for questions. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Meg Williams. Um, I'm at MFAT. I work in inclusive development in the aid program. Um, one of the trends we've seen over the last kind of five years or so um, is countries across the world increasingly adopting feminist foreign policies. So I think there are four now with feminist foreign policies. Last year, Sweden adopted a feminist trade policy, being the first country to do so. Um, I'm interested to kind of hear your thoughts as to whether you think more countries will start to adopt feminist trade policies and how you envision what a truly feminist trade policy really looks like within a kind of neoliberal context. We can, we can all, you can all have a, a wee go at that one, maybe. It's a big question, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess for, for me, I, I hope <laughs> that more countries do start to look at feminist trade policy. Um, I would want to see that it were at, through that gender-based analysis lens, actually, I thought that was a really great tool for being able to make sure that for New Zealand, for instance, for Māori, but also for our Pacifica whānau as well, and also for our broader migrant communities, um, because I find that gender and race seem to be some really big parts of New Zealand's trade policy that really need to be addressed. And we're seeing that anyway when we're looking, you know, there are two big priorities, gender and indigenous. So um, that would, I'll pass over to Steph for the more technical <laughs> reply. Um, well, yeah. great, great question, thank you. I think it's a little bit, as Van Gally commented earlier, you know, it's it can be a bit of a hard sell. I mean, I would say that Perhaps we've branded it slightly differently in the sense that our trade policy is about trade for all um, rather than, you know, being feminist as such or indigenous as such. I think there's this concept that we want everybody to be able to share in the opportunities and benefits of trade uh, and, and how we design our policies to achieve that. But I think looking at it more globally, which was your question, will we see a wider adoption? I mean, if you look at... Uh, if a couple of years ago, three years ago now, in the Buenos Aires WTO ministerial meeting, there was this declaration on, on women's economic empowerment. Um, only, I think, 118 countries have signed up to that. There are 164 WTO members. And, you know, to be to be a little bit uh, sort of unkind, it's, it's pretty once over lightly. I mean, it talks about aspirational language, but there's not a lot of uh, teeth in that. Um, there are 69 FTAs notified to the WTO that have trade and gender provisions in them, 250 with, I guess, what you could say a sort of trade and gender adjacent kinds of concepts. So that's not a lot when you think that there are sort of 350, 400-odd FTAs. But I think the work that is done at these sorts of conferences and things like the Global Trade and Gender Arrangement, the ITAG, that, you know, hopefully we'll get more countries on board with are really important to raise the profile of the start people thinking, a little bit like Georgina said, we actually need to get people away from the old mindset and, and think about this as not just because it's the right thing to do, which I really strongly believe, but also because there's money involved with it. If we want to enhance prosperity, whether you're a man or a woman, you need more inclusive trade and, uh, you know, let's not leave money on the table. Uh, yes, so I guess because I'm coming from a more of a um, grassroots perspective, yes, I mean, it would be great to have, if I put in the context of the Pacific, it would be great to have more feminist policy. However, I have seen um, in terms of, for example, uh, and again, going back to Samoa as an example, um, with um, parliamentarians, there's now a 3% threshold for parliamentarians, uh, women, um, to, to actually have seats in parliament. But I think it needs to take a step further than just policy, in my opinion. Um, it really has to come from leadership, whether that's leadership of the government, leadership of a particular ministry, and leadership um, from the various um, business organizations that contribute to trade policy. I think that even if there was policies in place if those, the leaders of those organizations and governments don't truly believe in women fully participating in trade, then it'll just be another policy that's not really brought into fruition. So I, I see the more important part is, I guess, um, someone mentioned mindset, is the mindset of those key decision makers and leaders in implementing trade policy is more important than actually the policy itself. That, that would be my opinion. 
I might just jump in here too. Um, so as someone who's um, given advice or a support to the Ministry for Women and the development of their bringing gender into, I would just endorse the work that they have done and for all of you who should be actually familiar with this tool already, um, it was very much um, um, built off the Canadian um, equivalent and, and we saw on one of Georgina's slides that Canada is also adopted a feminist foreign policy approach. So I suppose from my perspective, it's about putting gender equality from an intersectional perspective at the heart of everything we do um, in the trade space, um, ex, ex ante and ex post. So we're thinking about it before we go into the trade agreement negotiation process, but we're also evaluating the outcomes and we're doing it in a cyclical way, so all of the time. But I agree, it's about leadership, it's about technical expertise, and it's about everybody owning the fact that placing a gender lens across all aspects of trade policy is gonna better the lives of women and men. It's not just about women. So after that diatribe, would anybody else like to ask a question? <laughs> My name is Pallavi, Ministry for Primary Industries. Uh, and my question's for Jackie. Um, Jackie, because you have that grassroots perspective, um, my question is, with innovative products like you mentioned, like vanilla honey, what are the barriers? I'm interested to hear in a bit more detail what the barriers are for women to exporting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now I get that little bit more time I ran out of. Um, <laughs> uh, really the barriers, um, one, first of all, I brought up the first one, investment, absolutely. Um, women in the Pacific um, Islands um, do not always have access to um, collateral. Um, and part of that may be because um, in a lot of the Pacific Islands, um, customary land cannot be used as collateral, which most of our women um, live on with their families. Um, but additionally, um, if they're married, obviously there's barriers, you know, gender barriers with, you know, um, partners, um, significant others, enabling women to actually use those assets um, to grow their businesses. So, and taking it to the next step, even then, if they had access to collateral, it may still not be enough and it may put their business at risk by taking on so you know, um, uh, financing, for example. So I really, I have, as I mentioned, I've seen many um, businesses. Um, one vanilla business I've seen in particular at the moment is trying to look for investment. Um, and it's really tough to get to, to that stage of being investment ready, because remember, these businesses are based in the Pacific Islands. And our perception here in New Zealand or in a country like Australia, which are probably our two closest countries that would be able to provide investment, the barriers are so high, the due diligence requirements are so high to meet that that is a huge gap in itself to become investment ready. And I've been a part of that space of trying to help businesses to become investment ready. And sometimes it can take two or three years to get to that point, and yet they're still trying to operationalize a business. Um, so there was one other thing I brought up here. Also, some of the other um, barriers for, for scaling up also include the opportunity to actually participate in e-commerce and to be able to, to utilize those channels as well to be able to scale up. And um, there are many different reasons for that, shipping, lack of payment gateways, um, and also um, being able to access, um, I guess, facilities that are available in New Zealand and Australia, such as picking and fulfillment um, order centers. And then, of course, there's production, manufacturing, uh, supply chain. I mean, I could go on all day, but um, the, the barriers are real, but the opportunity is there. And going back to my opening line, e auli e mai lawa to mai tai, Women, when you do um, enable them, they can really create amazing things, but it's just helping them out to get to that point. Thank you.
Kia ora koutou. Thank you for that. It's, it's great. Um, I've just got a very marginal question and when it comes to gender and trade. Uh, New Zealand holds the title with the most, um, uh, the greatest uh, rainbow uh, parliament in the world at the moment. And uh, when we think of uh, the LGBT community, uh, what do you think are the critical issues for that with regards to trade, given that we know that people from that community are five times more likely to be homeless? Uh, homelessness is a pretty important determinant around being able to be employed. You can't trade if you're unemployed. Kia ora. I actually feel like that's more of a domestic policy discussion that has to happen in order to enable people who are experiencing multiple discriminations to be in a position to be um, in the trading environment. Um, I'm not sure what the, the priorities are, but I think there's also undoing, I think there's an industry responsibility here too, actually, because a lot of industries are the ones that are discriminatory against that particular community, and they have to take responsibility. But there is, um, I think, greater impetus having a really diverse parliament to really start changing those narratives and being involved in those sectors and different roles in their ministerial portfolios. Um, I'm hoping to see bigger change, but I actually think it is up to industry to really undo the discrimination that they have in their rankings, um, as well as across the public sector. And I know there's a lot of work that's been doing done in that way, but in the private sector, there's still a heap of work that has to be done for people to feel safe to move into those roles where they can start getting into kind of the tradable sector and start getting those skills and opportunities. Uh, well, I, I don't really have anything sort of much to add. I mean, I absolutely agree, Carrie. I think it's a, there's a lot that, of work that we need to do in domestic enablement. Um, but I would just make one observation, which I guess is a, a kind of a lesson from the, the gender discussion, which is that services trade and digital trade can offer opportunities in a way that lessens the, the hurdle of discrimination uh, because, you know, obviously, if you're able to use digital channels to market, digitally provided services, e-commerce platforms, you know, it, it is sort of immediately wipes out a large sort of opportunity for discrimination, if you like. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I guess there's getting to the starting point, which, you know, to your comment, but, but once people are there, I think, you know, for me, one of the exciting potentialities is if we can liberalise trade and services and make sure that trade, digital trade is able to operate really effectively, which, you know, is not a foregone conclusion. There are some great opportunities there, potentially. That's a great question um, that you've asked. Um, I did bring up some of the industries, and one industry, um, well, to touch on Pacific, uh, we um, have... I guess our own gender in terms of also known as Fafafine, Fakaleti, and other, other um, names there. They are actually kind of uplifted in our societies in their, their space and the, the space that they occupy. They're very um, dominant um, gender and very um, driven. And I would say uh, in, in, in their own rights, um, in the types of businesses they run and participate in, train quite active in the Pacific region. Um, whether they face barriers when they come out of that, that safe space in the Pacific, um, I'm not really sure. But I can say that there are particular industries as well, so it's, and I particularly um, look at fashion performing arts, where they're really quite successful, and if those... I guess industries were better supported that would also address not just women but LBTQI in the Pacific region. Thank you. I suppose I would just comment by asking a question as a non APEC specialist. Um, I, I was involved in, in the APEC 21 sort of consultations and as a listening in person. And I, I suppose what, what my question back to the trade policy experts would be is, does APEC and its consensus driven um, need to be, need to make sure that there isn't an offending of all the countries that are involved mean that tough topics like LGBTQI discrimination and issues even of gender equality rather than women in the economy, are they too hard? for the APEC agenda or that forum because of the need for consensus. And so listening in on some of those conversations, I felt like 
um, and it was kind of reflects what the Indigenous Trade Panel was talking about this morning, that sometimes those are quite hard and so they might get parked. So I don't have a solution, it's more like a question because I, I'm very curious about this in the broader trade um, environment. But on that note, I'm afraid, we've come to one o'clock, which means you get to share Kai again. Um, but before doing that, I would like to ask you to join with me in thanking our speakers today. We're back at 1.30 on the dot. <laughs>